Hello, and welcome to this week's lecture on mass communication, and more specifically, intro to mass communication. I am Professor Cyrus Sotzes, and today's topic of discussion is going to be radio, that medium that at one point in the not too distant past was incredibly influ influential, incredibly powerful, but as people have um, switched over to digital platforms and when, with the audio format, more specifically either podcasts or streaming devices, um, the radio industry doesn't quite have the power or the revenue it once did, but it still exists, it's still strong, and it's very important to learn about the history of it to get a better, better understanding of mass media today. Um, because of so much of what you see in terms of the media, in terms of mass comm, um, is, has roots and a foundation largely based in the radio industry. Um, so why don't I go to the PowerPoint for today, which again is going to be about radio. And just a reminder as well, um, all the lessons here uh, are based off the textbook, um, Understanding Media and Culture, and Introduction to Mass Communication. Uh, and yeah, so why don't we get started? Um, let me expand my screen here. All right, so I'm gonna skip this page in terms of describing it. Uh, this is primarily for any of my students watching this video. Uh, the following are learning outcomes for the previous week's topic, which was music, uh, which I did not do a lecture for. Um, the textbook, in my opinion, covers that topic extensively, accurately, and comprehensively. Um, but make sure you review these learning outcomes. Uh, again, all these lectures, uh, the learning materials, including PowerPoints, are available um, in your appropriate modules. But the And again, this lecture coincides with um, the textbook. And the textbook first starts off focusing on how radio was invented. It was invented by Guglielmo Marconi. Uh, who read a biography of Heinrich Hertz, um, who himself had written and experimented with early forms of wireless transmission. Marconi uh, took those experiments, took that information, and invented a radio. And Marconi is recognized still today as the, the founder of radio. And radio's beginnings were interesting. This is a, an example of a wireless transmitter. This is a large radio tower based in Brant Rock, Massachusetts. This image comes from the textbook. Uh, the textbook talks about how during World War I, radio was banned. Um, this was partly to avoid propagandic messages um, and to avoid disturbances to, so, so that the, the primary focus was the war itself. Now, following World War I, Radio stations developed regular programming that included religious sermons. Sports was big, especially baseball, um, and then news. And radio was really big in the sense that this was the first platform in human history where information was transmitted instantaneously. Before this, people consumed their information uh, either through newspapers, which usually had a delay of 24 hours or so, simply because you had to gather the information, write the information, print the information, and then distribute the newspapers which had the information. And that process took about a day or so, if not more. Um, you had various uh, uh, film screenings but again, those weren't instantaneous, and a lot of those were based in propaganda published by governments. But radio was immediate, it was fast, it, was, it really was the first form of instantaneous uh, mass communication. Um, and then businesses, such as department stores like your Macy's and Sears, they often had their own radio stations. Um, and radio advertising in the early days was originally considered an unprecedented invasion of privacy. So you didn't have ads. Now granted, a department store that often owned their own radio station was probably marketing their store and their products, but in terms of taking breaks for advertising, again, it was considered an invasion of privacy. Um, it was not considered a social norm, and so you didn't have that. Um, however, when the Great Depression hit, which started in 1929 and carried through the 1930s, um, the economy was in collapse. You had unemployment hovering at approximately 25%. And so local radio stations needed new sources of revenue. And so eventually the what was once considered unethical 
um, suddenly became very normal because revenue was needed and so advertising became a very normal part of the radio landscape. Now radio networks were immensely powerful and many of them led to the huge television networks and multimedia conglomerations and corporations we see today. In 1926, RCA started the National Broadcasting Network, which we know today as NBC. Uh, two years later, the United Independent Broadcasters uh, relabeled themselves, reinvented themselves as the Columbia Broadcasting System, known today as CBS. This was nearly a hundred years ago now. And variety shows were the primary format on radio. Um, you often had performers, uh, a host introducing them. Um, there were numerous different acts. Um, everything you consider television today, everything you consider to be a, a dr dramatic today that you either see, it could be on a mobile device, could be a TV screen, um, originally started with radio shows. And you had to sit there and visualize in your mind um, everything that was being uh, communicated, again, through this medium. Um, so there are variety shows, including styles as diverse as jazz. Um, early country music was being played. Um, and then at night, you had dramas and comedies such as a show called Amos and Andy, The Lone Ranger debuted in this format, um, and a show called Fibber McGee and Molly. And the textbook provides some photos. Uh, that's Amos and Andy right there. That is the original Lone Ranger. And that is Fibber McGee and Molly. Fibber McGee and Molly, I have no idea who they are, but, uh, but apparently they were a big, big act back in the day. So, in 1927, the U.S. government passed the Radio Act of 1927, which established the Federal Radio Commission. This was a precursor to what we have today, which is the Federal Communications Commission, better known as the FCC. It's part of the executive branch of government. Uh, a year after its creation, the FRC reallocated station bandwidths to correct interference problems. So, when you think of a radio, like if you turn on a radio in a car, for example, and you see different numbers like 104.5, 105.3, you know, 97.3, whatever it is, whatever station you're listening to, um, it's being transmitted through an electromagnetic spectrum. And there's only so many bandwidths, so so you cannot overlap uh, each individual bandwidth that is being broadcasted on. So the FRC had to make sure that nobody was interfering with each other, so you weren't hearing either static or two sources clashing with each other, which would sound awful. Um, and the electromagnetic spectrum again, electromagnetic spectrum. I'm sorry, back then was how broadcast was distributed, both for TV and for radio. Radio originally, obviously, and then TV later. Um, and this allowed major networks such as CBS and NBC to gain 70% of the share of U.S. broadcasting by the early 1930s, earning them $72 million in profits by 1934. And based on inflation numbers, that $72 million number is much higher today. Um, and these visuals that the textbook provides gives you an idea of the electromagnetic spectrum um, and the range of it. Certain, certain aspects of it present visible light. Uh, certain aspects of it are used for ultraviolet or for x-rays. Um, and then a certain part of it here on this lower end is for radio, um, both AM and FM, and television. And that is how, again, at least back then, and even today, with radio, although TV doesn't follow this anymore, TV is digital now, um, but with radio, this is how it's transmitted. And the difference between an AM wavelength and an FM wavelength is the size of it. So any broadcast transmitted over FM, which is frequency modulation, has wavelengths that go much higher than an AM wavelength, but they're also shorter. So what that means is, is that you're getting much higher quality. That is why with FM radio, you're primarily listening to music stations, mostly, although things are changing in this day and age. Whereas with AM, that was designed more for talk radio because AM wavelengths are much shorter than the FM wavelengths, but because they're shorter, they also travel longer. They cover more distance. So with an AM frequency, you have much less quality because of the shorter wavelengths, 
but the transmission itself travels much further because the shorter wavelengths uh, uh, transpire out, transpire out. So for example, um, uh, for many years, I worked for a radio station called KNBR. This was based in San Francisco. They were the, the number two sports talk radio station in the country after WFAN in New York. And our transmitter, which was 50,000 watts, was actually aimed into the San Francisco Bay. It would reflect off the water and travel for sometimes thousands of miles. We would get listeners calling in from Canada, from Baja, uh, uh, Baja California, Mexico. Uh, even Hawaii. Um, and again, it's because the AM frequency is shorter, so it can travel much further lengths. Whereas with an FM frequency, because it's much taller and longer vertically, it doesn't travel as far. So while the quality is very high, 50 miles away, you might not be able to hear that signal at all. So that is the fundamental difference between an AM and an FM frequency. And this chart shows you again the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, radio news broadcasts were very popular because, as I mentioned a moment ago, it was the first form of immediate mass communication. And the popularity of radio news broadcasts surpassed newspapers by the late 1930s. In 1940, Edward R. Murrow, you may have heard his name, they, they hand out the, the Murrow Awards for, uh, it's considered one of the most prestigious broadcast journalism awards. Um, Edward R. Murrow was a journalist working in England in 1940, and he was broadcasting first-hand accounts of the German bombings of London. Uh, a friendly reminder, World War II was from 1941 to 1945, but the war actually had started years earlier, I believe in 1939, uh, and, and the war at that point was focused more strictly in Europe. It wasn't until Japan bombed Pearl Harbor that the United States got involved and suddenly became a world war. So in 1940, Edward R. Murrow was was giving first-hand accounts of the Germans bombing London uh, and other parts of England. And, and uh, I believe George Clooney directed a great movie uh, focused on Edward R. Murrow, if you ever want to watch that. It's, it's in black and white, but still fantastic. Um, radio news outlets, as I mentioned Pearl Harbor a moment ago, they were the first to broadcast that attack. Um, and then in 1934, uh, the U.S. government passed the Communications Act of 1934, which created the federal Communications Commission, which is still in power today. Uh, it's a five-member commission, uh, and usually the predominant controlling uh, political party in the White House um, has the majority of seats on the commission. So if a Democrat is president, you will likely have three Democratic members to Republican, whereas if, a, uh, if you have a Republican president, then you will likely have three Republican members and two Democrats. Um, so that is the FCC. The FCC used to be much more powerful back when uh, mass media was limited to traditional legacy media outlets like TV, like radio. Um, it's a loss. It has lost a lot of its influence uh, when it comes to digital media just because it's so much harder to regulate. Um, RCA was eventually forced to sell its NBC Blue Network, and when you hear forced to sell, that often means government intervention, antitrust laws. The government used to be much more litigious uh, when it comes to monopolies, and they would oftentimes attempt to break up large media uh, corporations. Um, you oftentimes hear talks about potentially breaking up Facebook or potentially breaking up Google for very similar measures. These are immensely powerful corporations that control a lot of the messages that are being sped to the public. Um, and the government has rules in place to prevent monopolies and a lot of control by one single entity. So in 1943, RCA was forced to sell its NBC Blue Network, and the spinoff became the American Broadcasting Corporation, better known as ABC. This was in 1943. In 1949, the FCC established the Fairness Doctrine. This is a vitally important uh, a piece of legislation. Um, as a rule stating that if a broadcaster editorialized in favor of a position on a particular issue, they had to give equal time to all other reasonable positions on that issue. And there is no coincidence that when Ronald Reagan decided to abolish the Fairness Debt Doctrine in 1987, that we immediately saw a drastic rise in political and ideological divisions in our country. Um, once upon a time, not too long ago, before the Fairness Doctrine was rescinded, 
this country was much more unified. You had presidents, for example, winning in landslide elections. We haven't seen one, not one of those since the Fairness Doctrine was rescinded. And uh, <clears throat> I apologize for all the noise in the background there. Um, and so the Fairness Doctrine, in many ways, is the reason why we have so much editorialized content today. Uh, because again, anytime a media company would publish any form of media content that was editorialized in favor of a, of a position, they had to give equal time to the other side of that position. So most of the news that, that Americans consumed up until approximately 1987 um, was considered to be objective and was considered to be balanced. And then when, when Ronald Reagan uh, rescinded the Fairness Doctrine, you saw Fox News rise. You saw AM talk radio rise. Uh, and then in, in today's world, obviously, between social media and all the many different news aggregates, um, I, there's just no way you could ever reinstate something like this. But this is the primary reason why our news media went from being a much more trustworthy source of information because they literally had to publish objective news to what we see today where there's tremendous distrust and the overwhelming majority of the media content um, is editorialized or subjective. And it is not healthy for a free democratic society to have so much subjective content being distributed to the public. It is just simply not healthy to have a public that is misinformed as much as we are or having uh, propagandic views pushed on the citizens as much as we see today. Um, in 1996, Bill Clinton passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Um, this is one measure I certainly did not support, and this led in many ways to the demise of radio because it increased consolidation by eliminating numerous rules, including a duopoly rule, which until this act was passed, prohibited dual station ownerships in the same market. For example, one company could not own a newspaper and a TV station in the same market because uh, the government considered that to be a monopoly on information spread to the public and it would increase the possibility of corruption and of propaganda. Uh, Bill Clinton rescinded that. He also lifted the numerical limits on station ownership by a single entity. Before this law, I believe uh, one company could only own two or three radio stations per market. I believe that number increased to 10. The textbook should have more information, and Google is your friend for that specific information as well. The long story short, though, is that this act destroyed a high-quality radio because it went from ha being owned by numerous uh, entities and organizations. Thus, you had much more community radio, you had much more uh, radio content that was locally driven and focused on local news, to having one station in LA or New York broadcasting one message to hundreds of markets across the country. And again, this took away competitiveness, which is always healthy for strong business. Um, this took away, again, the community feel of radio. It took away the diversity of the different formats because you suddenly only had a handful of corporations that owned everything. And there was no need to have local DJs and local broadcast broadcasters everywhere because you could just have one person, again, syndicating a show from one market to every market across the country. And so large corporations such as Clear Channel, which in my radio days, we call them the evil empire. Uh, that name started to catch on so much that they rebranded themselves as iHeartRadio. Uh, they bought up radio stations all across the country. And they reformatted a lot of these radio stations so that instead of having radio stations compete against each other in local markets, um, they all now focus on the same thing. And competition was gone. And when you don't have competition in business, you have less business, you have less quality in the product uh, that you're producing, which in this case was radio. Um, and this practice again led to mainstream radio's present state in which narrow formats target highly specific democratic demographic audiences, I'm sorry. As someone again who has worked in radio for decades, I literally saw an industry that thrived to an industry that literally has just a handful of employees once did because corporations don't need more employees. And this has resulted in much lower quality on the radio that is being uh, uh, broadcasted and produced and disseminated. 
but it's also uh, largely the reason as well for the rise in digital platforms because people really just did not like it. And with new te technological affordances, people can now consume podcasts, they can stream, they can play any, any content they download themselves. Um, and again, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 also reduced local coverage and diversity of programming because there was no competition and because only a handful of, of corporations owned everything, whereas before you had a lot of companies owning a lot of media uh, uh, stations. And uh, it's, I'm still very disappointed by that. Um, uh, the textbook talks about the War of the Worlds, which is a great example of the power of mass communication. Um, on Halloween night, 1938, radio producer Orson Welles told his listeners that they would be treated to an original adaption of H.G. Wells' classic science fiction novel, The War of the Worlds. Now, the problem is that for anyone who t tuned into this radio show 5, 10, 15 minutes late, they were not being informed that this was a dramatic staged act. And a lot of people panicked because they thought that the radio broadcast was a real story. Um, so again, many listeners tuned in late. They didn't hear the disclaimer that this was this was fictionalized. And they started believing this was an actual news story. And this is a picture of Orson Welles from the textbook. Uh, and this is also from the textbook. It's the front page of the Boston Daily Globe with the headline, Radio Play Terrifies Nation. Uh, and... and if you Google it, um, for any students who have access to this original PowerPoint, this hyperlink actually goes to uh, the original War of the Worlds broadcast. You can also simply Google War of the Worlds in YouTube. Um, and, and if you ever want to hear the original broadcast, it's right there. And this was a, a really a huge catalyst for Orson Welles' career. Um, he went on making Citizen Kane and being one of the most uh, high-profile and also very controversial um, film directors slash writers slash actors. Uh, the textbook also breaks down the current demographics of what radio stations play. Um, this chart is a little dated. Uh, alternative undoubtedly has dropped um, in terms of the percentages, uh, but otherwise it should be fairly, this should be fairly accurate. The, the alternative number is probably the one that's dropped more than anything else. Um, and again, these are the top radio formats. Uh, and what do we have today? So obviously the landscape now is very different. Satellite radio is in existence and they produce incredibly high quality content. Um, and all you have to do is subscribe to them. HD radio is a real thing. A lot of what we consider to be terrestrial radio, which refers to radio that's consumed via traditional um, radio towers. Uh, uh, literally, you're literally um, consuming the, the radio broadcast through traditional wavelengths. Um, whereas HD radio, the wavelengths are transmitted digitally. So if you ever listen to a radio station in your car, for example, and your screen tells you what the station is and who the artist is playing the song and the name of the song, that means you're listening to an HD radio. Um, internet radio is similar. It streams audio programs to the medium of the internet. Um, podcasts have again grown wildly in popularity. And on a side note, if you love the Golden State Warriors, I host two podcasts, one of those being the Rick Barry Show with NBA Hall of Famer Rick Barry, um, and also Locked On Warriors, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, um, owned by Tegna, which was originally part of Gannett, who owns USA Today among many news stations. They split into two. Gannett remains, but they're primarily the news division. Tegna is the broadcast division of that company, and there are a lot of podcasts out there to choose from. Um, and when we talk about internet radio, this also refers to streaming, right? So whether you listen to Pandora, SoundCloud, um, you name it. I mean, there's so many options to choose from now. And the great news is you can literally listen to whatever you want. Um, that is one of the huge perks, obviously, of digital content today. So that is the subject, and that is the chapter on radio. I hope that was informative, and I hope it was a little enlightening. Um, yeah, and, and that's it. I'll see you all soon. Thank you.